um, I'm from Plainville, Georgia, and I went to Berry College and uh, got a degree in physics there. One of the first two women to get a physics degree from that school, my roommate and I, we, uh, we tried a lot of different majors, and uh, we went to the soda shop there on campus, and uh, we decided, well, let's just see who comes in. Let's watch the men. And we did, and we decided, hey, the best-looking men are in physics. That's what we're going to major in. <laughs> and it, as it turned out, we married each one of us, married one of them. You know, people were gravitating towards physics because the Sputnik had launched a good bit earlier, you know, and it seemed like the natural thing to do to get into something that you could uh, help the country. And I applied for a... Um, a fellowship to the University of Alabama, mainly because my boyfriend was going there. And uh, I did get the fellowship, so I was in my first year of graduate school there, and a friend was attending school there, and she said, let's go up to Huntsville. They're hiring a lot of people. And of course, at that point in time, I was tired of not having any money. So we came up, and uh, we were hired. <laughs> so that's how it all began. That was in the mid-60s. Of course, the uh, group that hired was located out on the parkway, so we met with them first, and they said, well, wh what are your interests? And I said, well, I'm interested in the, what goes on in the laboratory. So they uh, gave me an Im interview into the materials and processes laboratory. And of course, at that point in time, you came in all dressed up with gloves on and that kind of thing, and I visited the people. and. Uh, I got an offer right off. And of course, you worked with someone, you know, you weren't out on your own, at least initially. Uh, but when you had a problem, uh, there were so many experts, not only in the materials and processes laboratory, but in other areas at the center, in structures, in avionics, and they would say, well, go ask so-and-so about that problem. And it was just wonderful to have all these people that you could talk to. And I know one of the first things that I was asked to do, we were looking at the design of some slip rings. And I had never made an engineering drawing, and I much less put a, a tolerance on it. And uh, so I sketched up something. We had plenty of machine shops around. And, uh, gave them the drawing or sent the drawing to them. And I got a call to come over and see these folks. And uh, here was the head of the machine shop and about three or four technicians standing around him. And uh, I said, are you sure you want those tolerance, hun? I said, yes, I want that. But they talked me out of it. I mean, a six millionth was a little bit much on a slip ring tolerance. <laughs> But um, that taught me a little lesson. Hey, let other people look at your drawing before you submit it to be made. No. Oh, they were so nice to me, and uh, I never felt like I wasn't liked in the workforce or was discriminated against or anything like that. They were very helpful, and, and I thought it was just a great place to work. I guess I never thought about it as mentor. I, I just tried to do the best I could. And, and uh, you know, I might have a project assigned and I would go give my report, you know, both verbally and written to my supervisor, but it wasn't like somebody standing around to help you all the time. It was a good environment. The group that I worked in was called Lubrication and Surface Physics, and of course at that point in time there were a lot of mechanisms, rubbing and sliding mechanisms on spacecraft, and you needed to know how to, you know, reduce the friction on those surfaces and make sure it operated. And uh, of course you could use greases or oils or anything like that, so we developed new lubricants, dry films, using molybdenum disulfide, which you know, did rely on having oxygen to give it its lubricating properties like graphite does. So uh, we uh, developed those. We had some initials that we used for these lubricants. 
MLFs, which really stood for mighty low friction, but we didn't tell anybody that's what it stood for. And then we would give it a name, and it depended on whether we really liked that person or not. If it had a high probability of working, <laughs> we gave it a, a person's name that uh, we liked. We were pretty much in the trenches, you know. Uh, we could only really see what we were doing in the laboratory, but there were lots of things going on. It was a very busy time. Well, there were uh, a few that came in the lab, and uh, of course, Dr. Von Braun walked through a few times and stuck his head in the door and wanted to know what you were doing. Uh, so I think I experienced that a couple of times. Plus, we had a lot of visitors from the outside that came in to see uh, what we were doing. Like, we had Dr. Christian Bernard, you know, the South African heart doctor that came in, and James Webb came in, had his children with him, and we got to tour them around. And one of the things I got to, which I thought was funny at the time, was when Art Carney was making a movie in town, and I was asked to show him through the Space and Rocket Center. Well, the only thing I'd ever seen him do was play Norton with Jackie Gleason, you know, and I kept thinking he's going to jump into that persona. <laughs> but no, he's a very serious guy, and um, I enjoyed it. Spent a lot of time with him. He's asked a lot of interesting questions. I only went to the Cape once, watched one launch, and that was Apollo 8, I think. The way it came about was I was going to Alabama-Missouri football game at uh, Jacksonville, and so I went on down to see the launch. You know, it just awes you, you know, you, you just sit there and take it all in. It was that NASA was such a capable organization, we could do anything. And uh, large spacecraft doing things that had never been done before. Uh, to me, it stands as the big icon that we look at and should keep that in mind when we do these tough projects. I just, it was amazing. Huntsville was on the brink of becoming a big city. Uh, there weren't any places to live. I was fortunate and had a friend that lived here, so uh, I stayed with her until we could find an apartment. And it was actually downtown, it's one of the lawyer's offices now. And we drew straws, and who got what room? Well, I got the hall, which was okay with me. <laughs> It, it was easy to just walk around and do what you wanted to in a small town. But, you know, that was to go away pretty soon. It was almost like we were isolated from that kind of thing. And it may be the fact that we were out on the arsenal, you know, and separate from other organizations. So you didn't see a lot of that at all, actually. I think I was always out there on my own doing what it took. And so it wasn't looking left or right and seeing these poor women waiting for their turn. They weren't there, so I just did what I did. Well, I was involved in the last uh, mission in terms of having a fluids experiment. We were going to see how the fluids reacted in that low gravity environment and to look at, you know, effect of surfactants on them and that kind of thing. When the shield came off, our laboratory, being materials and processes, we developed the umbrella. And of course, they did away with one of the astronomy experiments so we could use that port to put the umbrella out. But we developed the coating and and that was a round-the-clock activity. And uh, fortunately, it worked. You, you had to subject it to the environments of space, you, the simulated environments like the sun, um, you know, 
are the optical properties of the material enough to main be maintained and uh, it doesn't outgas uh, it's resistant to the ultraviolet that kind of thing will it last a long time so those were the kind of tests results that we had to determine Carolyn Griner and Mary Helen Johnston and I worked fairly close together, although on different things. And we decided we had put enough experiments together that we could actually, uh, you know, try to operate them. And uh, we, in a semi-closed environment, so to speak, it got a lot of publicity, and we had our own experiments, which we tried out and, and operate that. And we had some technicians that we would call on to help us if we needed it, but it was very interesting. We got a heck of a lot of publicity out of that for the center. Uh, then we got involved in diving in the tank, preparing for uh, possible missions. I think it was, uh, you know, being self-sufficient in that small environment and being prepared to do these things and to you know, I think there was a follow-on group of people that were chosen to do the same thing, and we uh, did a good bit of talking to them and what they needed to know. It was fun, and we, you know, we had a lot of interviews with various uh, media. Well, I mean, in a sense, it felt a little artificial, you know. You're doing this, and you know, hey, this is going to be over in a week or so. Keep doing what you're doing because this is really not real, you know. Well, I had experiments on uh, uh, Space Lab, right. and I had a number of experiments that uh, flew, enjoyed those. And I really enjoyed working with the scientists. Such a clever group of people, but the engineers were clever also. It just seemed like everybody was so smart and could do so many things. When you're in charge of engineers, you pretty much work with them. You know, it's, it's sort of a lead role in a sense. But the scientists, you just enable them because you're certainly not going to be out there telling them what to do in their science. And uh, so every time you change a job, you have to reinvent yourself to accommodate your job. And you just have to recognize that. To me, it's going out there and doing your best, and don't let anybody stop you. I mean, hey, just go through them. You know, don't don't stop. You do what you have to do. And you know, you don't have to make lifelong enemies, but you know, they don't have to be your best friends. Mm -hmm.